Hi, I'm Dr. Heather Hirsch and welcome back to my channel, Health by Heather Hirsch. We talk all things hormonal health, perimenopause, and menopause. Today, I want to cover polycystic ovarian syndrome or PCOS for short, and how perimenopause is very similar to PCOS in three separate ways. If you have struggled with PCOS, this is a great video to learn how to manage perimenopause with a history of PCOS, but if you've never had a history of PCOS, you are going to find this video extremely interesting as you're going through the perimenopause transition. I don't wanna waste anyone's valuable time, but if you wanna to get to know more about me, I will put some stuff at the end. Very quickly, I have a private tele medicine practice and a course for providers. You can find all of that in the description below. Very briefly, let's go over polycystic ovarian syndrome or PCOS for short. And that's what I'll call in the rest of this video. That is actually the most common endocrinopathy in reproductive age women. There is a lot to learn and there is a lot that scientists and clinicians are still uncovering when it comes to PCOS. But several years ago, we made the criteria for PCOS a little bit simpler. And to carry the diagnosis of PCOS, women should have two of the three following criteria. The first is elevated signs of androgenic activity. Androgens basically means testosterone. And so you could even see testosterone testosterone that's elevated on your labs, so a high free testosterone or total testosterone, that is going to give you the criteria. Or you could see clinical signs on a body that a woman has elevated signs of testosterone, and that's going to be acne, that could also be um, male pattern balding, that could be hair growth, specifically over the lip, under the chin, or on the chest. Now, again, a lot of people just may be prone to having more hair as part of their genetics or their race, but it's really when you see all of these things in a syndrome. So not just having chin hairs, that's just not gonna cut it. But the first thing that clinicians look for is elevated androgens, either on lab tests or clinical findings, as I just mentioned. The second is irregular periods. Now, irregular periods is a pretty broad diagnosis. Many women have irregular periods, but if it's outside of a you know 21 to 35 day window, or if there really is just no rhyme or reason to the cycle, we're gonna call that irregular periods. So an example could be if you're every 15 days, then every 42 days, then 36, then 35, then 72, then 14, that is going to give you that diagnosis of irregular periods because it's going to fall outside of that 21 to 35 days. Now, if you're still, for example, every 25, then 29, then 32, then 27, that we're still just gonna call regular periods, but just on not so much of a regular cadence. So irregular periods outside of a normal standard window is going to be criteria number two. Criteria number three used to be a lot more important, but it was called a string of pearls on an ultrasound finding. Now, because most women can be diagnosed by just one and two alone, you really don't necessarily need to see this string of pearls on an ultrasound. I'll actually show you a picture here. This is a string of pearls, and what it really is is that all of the follicles are waiting to be basically called upon by the endocrine system to, uh, or basically erupt out of the ovary so they could potentially be fertilized. And when those periods are irregular and the hormonal disruption is commonplace, instead of every month a follicle being released from the egg, they're all just kind of waiting, 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 waiting in this holding pattern, which gives you that string of pearl effect. You don't need to see a string of pearls on ultrasound finding to carry the diagnosis, um, but it can be helpful. And so to summarize, you need two out of those three items to be diagnosed with PCOS. And again, that is elevated androgens, either lab work or that you can see clinically. Uh, number two is gonna be the irregular periods, and number three would be a string of pearls on ultrasound. This video is not going to be about treating polycystic ovarian syndrome because I really wanna talk about how that hormonal disruption is really common place in perimenopause and what you could do about it. But if you do want a whole separate video on how to treat polycystic ovarian syndrome, definitely drop me a comment in the links below and I would love to expand on that topic. Now, while I said I wasn't going to actually go over the treatment, I am going to go over three important hormonal disruptions, I guess we could call them, during PCOS that happen during perimenopause. And this is gonna be really, really important again if you either have PCOS or if you're going through perimenopause, this is going to explain so much about what is going on with you. 
The first thing that happens in a polycystic ovarian syndrome that is also common in perimenopause is a drop in progesterone or another way we could say this is an imbalance of progesterone and estrogen. Now, a saying that I really do not like, but I hear all the time is estrogen dominance. The reason I do not like this term is one, it is not a clinical or medical terminology. It's basically slang. But the second reason is that, again, it makes estrogen sort of the enemy, or it makes us think that estrogen's too high and we need to bring it down. In truth, what's actually happening is that the progesterone is too low. So let's stop calling it estrogen dominance. Let's start calling it my progesterone is just way too low and how can I fix that? And the lowering of the progesterone happens both in PCOS and in perimenopause. Now, interestingly, in perimenopause, our progesterone starts to steadily decline, even before the estrogen starts to steadily decline. And the lowering of the progesterone in perimenopause causes some of the irregular periods. Same thing with PCOS. Now, progesterone is the hormone that kind of holds the uterine lining together. In a way, it's almost like the orchestrator of that uterine lining. You know, as um, the month is getting closer to your period, it's kind of waiting, 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 waiting. No egg is fertilized and it's going to release. And so the progesterone is kind of making sure that this happens in a succinct pattern. When this is declining, when the progesterone is declining in perimenopause, this can lead to irregular periods. And that is mainstay. That is one of the main things that we see in those criteria of polycystic ovarian syndrome. Now in perimenopause, the decline of the progesterone can also sometimes lead to insomnia and anxiety because progesterone is our natural calming hormone. Not always because all women are different, but progesterone does seem to have some calming capabilities. In fact, Prometrium, which is a treatment that we often use for low progesterone in perimenopause or sometimes in PCOS, acts on the GABA receptors in our brain, which causes us to kind of have this nice, sedating, relaxing feeling. It can help as well with those symptoms of anxiety and insomnia, and it can also help to create or set, establish a pattern of more regular bleeding. And so both of those things are true in PCOS and perimenopause. The progesterone is declining more steadily than the other hormones. The second physiologic disruption or change in PCOS that is very similar in perimenopause is that the estrogen is a little bit higher or out of balance compared to where that lowering of the progesterone is. In perimenopause, the estrogen is a lot more volatile and you can get huge spikes and swings of estrogen while that progesterone is still declining, creating a big delta between the two. And the exact same thing happens in PCOS. Again, it's why I don't like the term estrogen dominance because it's more about the delta and about maybe how low that progesterone is. It is not so much that estrogen itself is the problem. Estrogen certainly gets blamed for a lot of things. In perimenopause, that estrogen is really volatile. That's why women can get things like breast tenderness out of nowhere. That's why perimenopause can feel like a puberty in reverse. You can feel tearful one day, then angry, then sad, uh, and then have your period and feel better. It's because of that volatility in estrogen. And again, that happens as well in PCOS. So treatment could be, again, potentially bringing up that progesterone, closing those delta gaps. So a lot of times in perimenopause and PCOS, we're prescribing a progesterone that can really help. In perimenopause, we sometimes also prescribe postmenopausal estrogen in the form of a pill or a patch, a gel or a spray. And that actually helps to buffer the highs and lows of the estrogen. And in fact, that's actually what's happening in PCOS. Many women are treated with birth control pills, for example. And what that's doing is giving the patient a steady daily dose of both an estrogen and a progesterone because a birth control pill cannot exist without the progesterone. And it really just steadies those levels, right? So it's not that we are trying to give you an anti-estrogen, we're trying to steady the estrogen volatility. That is going to help specifically with major mood swings, breast tenderness, terrible PMS. Uh, it's really going to help offset some of those highs 
And then also in perimenopause, those lows. So while there's also volatility in estrogen, estrogen can also actually plummet and be really low, particularly in late perimenopause. In fact, I have a great video here on the difference between early and late perimenopause if you're really in the perimenopausal trenches. But specifically if your periods start spacing out to every two months, three months, six months, not only are you getting the volatility at times, but you're actually getting more low estrogen states. So you may be getting hot flashes, night sweats, um, dry skin, dry hair, dry nails, vaginal dryness. And so the postmenopausal estrogen, not only could it buffer the volatility in the highs, but also help with when estrogen is low. So that is where PCOS is again, similar to perimenopause. Now the third thing that happens in PCOS doesn't always happen in perimenopause, but I have a sinking suspicion that it does, but it hasn't been well documented. Now if we go back to PCOS, remember there's a big delta between the estrogen and the progesterone. So there's low progesterone, which makes the estrogen seem as though it's higher. And the third metabolic derangement that comes out of that is you can get a spike in testosterone. And so that's why in those PCOS criteria, the first thing we talked about was elevated androgens or elevated testosterone levels. Now, the, this also seems to happen to women in perimenopause. Now you might be saying, wait a second, you mean to tell me that my testosterone's high? A lot of women actually find that their testosterone is low, but I think this might be short lived. Now, high testosterone can be sometimes high libido. So sometimes women might notice this very sporadically. And I think that in perimenopause, at the beginning of perimenopause, maybe early perimenopause, some women will tell me they had a really good libido in their late 30s or their early 40s and all of a sudden it crashed. And that could be because after that spike in testosterone, it actually does start to decline naturally into the menopause transition. Elevated testosterone can also be a reason why women in perimenopause may all of a sudden be getting acne. And you're thinking, how am I getting acne in my you know, late 30s or early 40s? And it really could be because of this physiologic PCOS that is happening to you while you're going through the perimenopause transition. So I do sometimes see that there is spikes in um, libido, there are spikes in sexual desire, there may be other signs of elevated androgens like you're shaving more all of a sudden, you've got hair on your chin or hair under your lip, you've got acne, those could be spikes in the testosterone because again what's happening in perimenopause similar to PCOS is the progesterone is steadily declining and the estrogen is becoming more volatile. Now there, those are the three things that can happen in PCOS that are similar to perimenopause. What does this mean if you do have PCOS? Well, truthfully, a little bit more of the same. And if you've been treating your PCOS well with either a progesterone, an estrogen stabilizer, something to maybe bring down testosterone, you're actually probably going to do well through the perimenopause transition. If your PCOS has been unmanaged, it's really good time to take stock and maybe managing the PCOS um, through the perimenopause transition. Now I told you at the end of the video, I was gonna tell you more about myself. So before I do, I hope that you found this video really interesting and helpful. Again, tell me in the comments, what's new? What did you learn? What do you want to learn more about? I'm Dr. Heather Hirsch. I'm the founder and CEO of the Health by Heather Hirsch MD Collaborative. This is a private telemedicine practice. We are open in almost all 50 states and we have clinicians who are readily available to treat you with perimenopause, menopause, sexual dysfunction, hormone therapy, all the things that you find on my channel. We absolutely eat, sleep, and breathe all of this and we believe that women should have all of the correct modern evidence-based up-to-date information at their fingertips to make the best decision for them. So link for that is in the description below. I'm also the author of the book, Unlock Your Menopause Type. It's a great place to start if you just wanna work with me but not ready to go all the way to having a visit yet. Definitely check out my book. And if you are a healthcare provider, oh boy, oh boy, do I have the course for you. I have an amazing flagship course, how to prescribe and manage hormone replacement therapy with ease and confidence, and many, many other courses. It's basically everything that you wish you learned in med school and residency that you didn't get to learn and it is for uh, clinicians, nurse practitioners, um, physicians assistants, as well as a pharmacist. Thank you guys so much for watching. I hope that you love these videos. Please consider subscribing so that you never miss a video and I can't wait to see you guys in next week's video. Bye everyone.